I have to now introduce uh, Margaret in a little more detail. Uh, as most of you know, Margaret is author of the internationally best-selling novel, The Handmaid's Tale, as well as uh, 40 books of poetry, fiction, and nonfiction, including Cat's Eye, Alias Grace, The Blind Assassin, Moral Disorder, The Door, Writing with Its Intent, Orcs and Crake, and The Year of the Flood. Uh, her investigation of debt in all its forms, uh, expected and unexpected, payback debt and the shadow side of wealth, was made into a documentary film that premiered at the Sundance Film Festival this year and is currently playing at the Film Forum. If you can see it uh, while it's there, it, it is, it's, it's wonderful. Um, Atwood was awarded the Booker Prize in 2000 for The Blind Assassin. She's also won the Governor's General Literary Award, the Gilbert Prize, the Premio, Premio Mondello, and more, more than I can list tonight. Um, and she's been described as one of the most brilliant and unpredictable novelists alive by the Literary Review. And the Chicago Tribune said of her, she deserves an adjective, at Woodian, <laughs> in recognition of her virtuoso wit and unmistakable style. Uh, and Jeanette Winterson, in a review of The Year of the Flood, in the New York Times uh, writes, I love this quote, I don't know if you all had a chance to catch this, part of Atwood's mastery as a writer is to use herself as a creative computer, modeling possible futures projected from the available data in human terms, where we are now. Atwood knows how to show us ourselves, but the mirror she holds up to life does more than reflect. It's like one of those mirrors made with mercury that gives us both a deepening and a distorting effect, allowing both the depths of human nature and its potential mutations. And since we're here tonight to talk about uh, mutations of a sort, evolution, revolution potentially, um, I want to start at a basic place, if that's okay with you, and I want to ask you a question you've, you've answered a lot, but, but uh, why, why, why write? Why, why tell stories? We could start there, uh, um, and, and both in terms of the impulses as human beings, but also why, did, why do it as a calling, as a profession? Um, yes, this is a question that concerns you too, Amy. It does. Because Amy is an editor of long standing. You, you may think she looks 12. <laughs> <laughs> it's a handicap, really. Yeah, she's 12. <laughs> um, so, but indeed, you have worked for a number of different magazines, and you have been my editor yes. on several occasions. I have indeed. I'm proud. Why are we getting together on this occasion? Because yes, we we've been through various things together. We have been. Things concerning commas. Yes, things concerning commas. It's <laughs> <laughs> quite perilous. Things concerning <laughs> adjectives. Yes. And yes. things of a larger note. Yes, yes. Such as, would he do that? Yes. Those kinds of things. Yes, indeed, we have. So you two are concerned with the telling of stories. I am. People yep. do not tell and write stories. You wouldn't have a job. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> or not this one. Yes. <laughs> Hopefully I'd be employed elsewhere. Somebody tried to hire you as a party planner, but you turned them down. I did. I thought I'd be crappy at that. Uh, but, uh, but, but who knows? Well, I said, you, you can do the party planning, but maybe we can sneak a bit of editing in there, too. Right. She's telling all my secrets. Don't tell Margaret Atwood a secret. I'm going to tell you <laughs> <laughs> So my next question to you is going to be, can I use that in a story? Sure, go ahead. Okay. We're all perishable. It is a story that right. you told to me, and I just told it to them. Right. And now I'm wondering whether I can retell it, whether I can tell it for the third time <laughs> in a mutated form, possibly right. somewhere else. Right. So the real question is not why write, right. but why do human beings tell stories? And the answer to that is human beings tell stories because they're human. Right. It is one of the things that comes built in Mm -hmm. And you can see what comes built in by looking at the behavior of quite young children. So they all sing, they learn language, um, they do a lot of physical motion, which uh, might mean that they will grow up to be ballerinas and it might not mean that. Uh, they make images when you give them the materials. Right. 
Right. So they do all of those things pretty naturally. Nobody has to teach them. They right. just pick them up. Right. And children under two understand stories. They understand a um, string of words in which something happens to someone. Right. So an event takes place over time, and the end is different from the beginning. And that's what we mean by uh, story, unless we're Andy Warhol doing an experimental film. Hmm? But even so, <laughs> time passes. Right. <laughs> and if you think that nothing is happening in, in, in waiting for Godot, right. think again. A lot happens in it. Right. It's just that they're talking about nothing happening. Right. But indeed, a great deal happens. The waiting so is very those eventful. Those are what stories are. Or as Leon Adele said about Henry James, if it's a novel, mm -hmm. there's going to be a clock in it. Yeah. Which means that stories take place over time. Right. That just seems to be something that we uh, evolved because it was to our benefit in the Pleistocene. And when you think about how beneficial it would be to be able to tell a group of people who hadn't experienced something, a bad thing or a good thing, right. about that thing, mm -hmm. so that they didn't have to start from scratch themselves, right. you can see that language and stories were amongst our earliest tools. Right. They are amongst our earliest technologies and all of these things that have come later are built on that, right. including um, long oral poems, mm -hmm. including methods of writing things down mm -hmm. so that somebody at a distance or in another time can bring your voice to life, whether that's a cuneiform tablet, a scroll, mm -hmm. or a paper book, or something on the dreaded internet. <laughs> they're all ways of <laughs> they're all ways of putting the stories out there right. one person to a, to another person or to other people. Right. We do that because we're human. Yeah. So that's kind of a long answer to your question. So right. again to the next part, why write? Well writing is a specialized form of that. Right. And um, it has some differences. There are differences between writing and oral storytelling. Mm -hmm. And now people are starting to talk about the differences between something that's written on a printed paper page right. and something that's read on an electronic device. Sure. Do those affect the brain differently? Mm -hmm. uh, has the um, internet affected how and what people write and how and what people read? Right. And do you think they have? Mm -hmm. um, and it has, has even brought to life some areas that people had thought were dead. Mm -hmm. And when you make a new platform available for people to put things out on, uh, they will populate that space very quickly. It's like bad bugs. No, it's not like bad bugs. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's not like bad Make bugs. the space available and things will move into it very quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you shut something down, yep. then you cut off that method of expression. Right. Point being, uh, when Oliver Cromwell closed down the English theater, mm -hmm. much to everyone's surprise, people stopped writing plays. Yeah. How could that be? Mm -hmm. <laughs> when um, there were a lot of Russian magazines yeah. in the 19th century, they published short fiction. Had they not done that, no Chekhov short stories. Mm -hmm. because he would not have had a place to, to publish, publish them. them. Mm -hmm. And it, not incidentally, those places paid him money. Mm -hmm. They paid him money. That was important to him. Of course. He, he had a family to support. Sure. He said, I write for money. He could end up a, ended was, up a party planner. Well, he could have, <laughs> actually, he was a doctor. So maybe he could have done a sort of crossover party planning medical thing. Right. That, that'd be an interesting hybrid. Yes. <laughs> you know, look at your tongue. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't do that. Um, yes, yeah, so, the, so that's just base, a basic thing. Mm -hmm. And I remember that quite well because in Canada in the early 60s, there were very, very few places that published short fiction. Right. And they did not, the very, 
few places that there were were, were uh, not places that paid you a lot of money. Right, right. But there was a radio program, right. which was our primary form of My very first one was in a magazine that didn't pay me anything, but, but my very first one for which I got paid mm. was a radio program. Mm. Mm. Well, may you say, mm. Mm. I, didn't, I didn't much like the who? way my piece was read. That's because, what I was about to ask you. Who yeah. read it? Well, it was the overacting school. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, <laughs> which no. actors refer to as helping the old boy out, oh. you know, basically writers need help, so you have to gasp. You have to do a certain amount of gasping. And Did they gasp in the right places? No. Oh. No, but... Sorry. Uh, so there are differences between reading on a page and... Sure. And things can be very well read. Right. Well, you can be. Well, your answer, the, the, the disappearance of, of, of platforms for things, we have to revisit that. Uh, how you read, how you receive stories in different ways, depending on how, whether you're hearing them or you're reading them, whether you're reading them in print, whether you're reading them on a device. I, I want to revisit all that, but one of the places I was hoping to go with you in terms of why write, and if someone's making the decision to write um, now, how is that different from, do you think, from having made the decision to write when you were starting out, given that this is the information age, since that, that it feels, as, as a friend of yours was saying today, that there's such an overwhelming amount of information? That, um, that there's so, so many ways of communicating that one might feel compelled, <laughs> there's no gun to their head, to keep up with this sense of participation, even performance, um, by way of social media. What kind of challenge does that create for a uh, developing would-be writer? Mm. OK, are we talking about somebody who has already written something? Um, can we do both? Sure. OK. How old is this person? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go with, tw they're in their 20s. They're in their 20s. Right, that this would be the one who's not yet arrived, and then we can go with someone in their 30s if you'd like. Maybe they've okay. published one thing. Um, well, if you're going to put yourself out there on social media, it's not going to be much good to you unless you've actually written something that you want people to read. Right. Uh, you could, I suppose, do a blog called, I'm really, really trying to finish my thing. <laughs> and then <laughs> people could go on to, it, on to it and give you encouragement. Right. And there are platforms for that. Right. Uh, there's one called Story is a State of Mind, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is really right. pretty good uh, all-in program for um, writing and completing a short story. It takes you every step of the way. Mm -hmm. You pay money. You download, you mm -hmm. get something like the Rosetta Stone language program mm -hmm. uh, combined with a social um, interaction in which other people doing the same program can read your thing and say, keep on with it, Amy, <laughs> things like that. Uh, God bless them. So yes, and that, that is actually, I'm not scoffing at it because right. everybody writes for someone. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they wouldn't bother. Mm -hmm. Even if they're writing a diary, right. if they don't want anybody to read it, they burn it. Even if they leave it in cipher, as a lot of diarists have, hidden somewhere, they are postulating a reader in the future. Right. So everybody does write for somebody. Right. And um, the you know, Bokoff's novel in the vault that no one burned. You yeah, assume. no one burned. Right. Yes, and we think that Emily Bronte wrote one that somebody did burn. That would be Charlotte. We're yeah. quite annoyed about that. Um, <laughs> sisters. If you, if you sisters. don't want anybody to read it, mm -hmm. either you don't write it or you destroy it. Mm -hmm. And if the reader is only yourself at a future time, you're still writing it for somebody. Right. So putting it out there and having people comment on it is right. not... Um, is not out of the picture. Right. It's you had a simple negligible. remedy for you had a simple remedy for the competing devices and ways of communicating, which was well, you can turn them off. And does that will, take a great you will act get of will? a lot of people telling you you have to do this. Right. Actually, there is nothing in this field that you have to do. Nobody is making you be a writer. You're not chained to the galley. 
Mm -hmm. uh, nobody's making you do social media. They may be suggesting it. Right. They may be urging it. They may be lecturing you. But when did that ever coerce somebody who was dead set against doing whatever it was? Mm -hmm. So you actually don't have to do any of it, and it's not for everyone. Mm -hmm. Let me bring in some, some dissenting voices. Uh, I had mentioned to you that, that Franzen, Jonathan Franzen, has said, it's doubtful that anyone with an internet connection at his workplace is writing good fiction. The internet brings lots of vulgar data. It is the antithesis of the imagination. It leaves nothing to the imagination. Actually, it leaves quite a lot to the imagination. <laughs> <laughs> he hasn't looked at Twitter, has he? At least no, he no. <laughs> oh dear. People put, up, people put up pictures of their cat. They do. You know, this is me. My name is Meow Meow. <laughs> <laughs> Who is this person really? You know, do we think it's actually a cat writing at the keyboard? No. <laughs> a, every person did a picture of their feet. Well, it, it, it well. My name is Poopsie, and this is my picture, and it's their toes. <laughs> What's going on? You have written so much about bioengineering, I think we could leave open the possibility that someday a cat may yet, uh, may yet. That tweet. may happen, but it yeah. hasn't happened yet. All right. Well, I won't argue with you. Um, uh, uh, among your many fans is, is Richard Powers, and he, he, uh, he and I corresponded, and he knew that we were going to do this together. So he had a question for you, which is in some way rephrasing some of the things that we've talked about. But uh, Richard Powers is a novelist. Richard Powers is a novelist. Uh, I have reviewed his novel. She has. There's a, there's a very good review of Margaret's on The Echo Maker uh, that you can find online on the New York Review of Books. It's on the New York Review of Books. <laughs> Who is that? <laughs> Cut it out. Um, Here's Richard Power's question. <laughs> Horace famously said that literature's role was to instruct and delight. We are moving headlong into a world where all formal, formal knowledge is available anytime and anywhere to anyone with the means. How does that change the instructional role of literature? What does the internet do to the novel's relations with information? Well, no. Hmm. First of all, you can't believe everything you read on the internet. Yes, that's important. There isn't a control there. No. Uh, second, you never know who you're actually talking to on the internet, or you mostly never know. Right. When I first went on Twitter, there were two other Margaret Atwoods. Yes. Uh, one of them with my picture. So I had to... Um, <laughs> yeah, Margaret, what did you do? Out. Well, I... I uh, <laughs> That's my secret, but they're not there anymore. <laughs> now, she won't keep your secrets, but she'll keep a lot. They're not there anymore. <laughs> uh, but then, then I had about three months of people saying, it's not really you, is it? And then I would say, yes, it is. And they would say, how do we know? Mm. <laughs> and how did you prove to them? You can do something called getting quotes verified on Twitter, mm -hmm. you get a little check mark, mm -hmm. but uh, it does sound like something out of an unpleasant sci-fi novel. Yes. Have you been verified? Yeah, yeah. Did, were you? Yes. <laughs> but it, <laughs> it took I a just want to make sure it's really and Then you. there were conversations that went on between the feet and the cats, and they said, uh, it, well, it has to be her because she's been verified. This is the kind of thing. It sounds that awful. This is why I don't tweet. <laughs> no, <right>. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that's so. This is how you get three hundred and nineteen thousand. This is the route to three hundred and nineteen thousand Twitter followers. That's how many followers Margaret has. On but they Twitter. may all be the same person. So <laughs> <laughs> a really tired <laughs> well, we someone. Actually, we, as I say, we don't Exhausted. actually know who they are. Although right. some of them are in this room. Hands up, Twitter followers. You wow. See? I did not lie. See, there's more than one. I, I did not lie, but they may be lying. <laughs> <laughs> Have you all been verified? Well, well, we'll take names afterward. Anyway, uh, they are a jolly bunch, and I've, I like my group of Twitter followers, and it, it is the thing that self-selects. Okay. So that the people who really aren't interested in you don't follow you. Right. Uh, you may get some people who are un unhealthily interested in you. That is a different thing. Right, can one have a Twitter stalker? One can block such a person. <laughs> it 
ter took one a little while you are a tricky to find lady. that out. <laughs> well, well, my <laughs> other Twitter followers said, you know, you can block them. Yeah. <laughs> what? I said, how do you do that? Well, you go. <laughs> They're very instructional. They'll tell you the answer. Uh, so yes, does it interfere with my writing? Mm -hmm. um, not really. Right. I think of it as having a little radio station in which you do public service announcements when you're not making typos. <laughs> you, you admitted to me that you might be a shade less productive. Did I hear you right when we talked about this once upon a time? We, well, I think you've, you might feel a shade less productive, but I'm not right. sure that you actually are. Your, your Twitter method, you told me, was to spend about 10 minutes a day doing 10, it. 10 to 15, but then, of course, you're, you're tempted to pop back on. Right. But there is right. a, a program you can get called, um, it's called Freedom. Freedom. You can download this thing called Freedom, which allows you to turn. Does Jonathan Franzen know? He doesn't need it. No. He doesn't have a, a connection in his writing room. Right, because God, but, what would that do to him? But if you're stuck in a hotel room with your computer, right. you're so tempted. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can turn on freedom. Seems like a hotel room is a temptation, and, and, and well, we won't explore that. It is a temptation, that. but yeah. you can also read novels in them, and I do that too. And you can also write in them, and I also do that. Right. So if I were to bring up Nicholas Carr's book, The Shallows, uh, what the internet is doing to our brains, and the worry that he has about... Uh, about it, we, uh, we become jet skiers rather than deep sea divers in terms of our, of our connection with, well, with... I think if that's all you do, but right. there is this supposition that if people are looking at one form or engaged right. in one form, they're not doing anything else. Right. Then you get these dire prophecies. Mm -hmm. When the telegraph came in, one man was very worried that it would ruin the novel. Right. It was actually a different form, mm -hmm. and it didn't have much to do with the novel, except that people now put telegraphs into their novels as part of the <laughs> plot. <Right? laughs> Received a telegraph. Watson sent me a telegram. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's in Sherlock Holmes. Uh, so technologies change what sorts, of, what sorts of drivers you can have for plots right. in works of fiction. Right. You can't do dial M for murder with a ringing telephone at a desk now right. because that wouldn't be what would happen. Mm -hmm. You have to deal with the cell phone. Right. So you can take out its SIM card, we all now know from reading Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, and right. mash it with a rock. <laughs> So you, you have to somehow account for the fact that if you've got any electronics on you, you're traceable. Yeah. So if you're a fugitive from the law, you have to not do that. We also know that you should not stick the credit card into the cash machine because they will know where you are. That's right. Yes. That they can find you. So all of those become plot elements, right. just as microchips became plot elements for Our Man in Havana right. and for um, Tinker Tail, no, uh, Smiley's People. Uh, these these ways of transmitting knowledge and information get into plots. Right. And do they change the form of the novel right. or, well, or fiction? I, right. I, I think what they change is the is the I think what changes that is the platforms for delivery. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when magazine fiction dried up yep. in the um, 60s and 70s and 80s, mm -hmm. people stopped writing that kind of magazine fiction, mm -hmm. uh, they continued writing literary short stories because there were still places they could publish those. Right. So, so, the so, New Yorker and literary magazines. Right. Now we have online platforms for delivering shorter fiction, mm -hmm. Byliner among them. For instance. Not the only one. No. There are others. No. Right. Um, Open Road Integrated Media sure. is one. Yeah. The Atavist mm -hmm. is one. Yeah. There are others. For, um, I do wish you wouldn't mention them. I know you do, being fair. <laughs> being fair. I know, I'm kidding. It's good yes, that you do. Yes, and uh, if you haven't caught up with the Wattpad, younger right. writers are using that a lot. You put, it's a social media thing for interchanging stories, and uh, they, have the, they have many categories, including vampires and horror and uh, things like that, which they seem to be very fond of. Yes, yes. Paranormal romance. Yes, yes that kind of thing. Yes, bodily fluids. I have to keep asking questions because 
I, I keep running into things that I don't know what they are. For instance, I had to say, what is paranormal romance? <laughs> well, it's <laughs> romance stories with vampires and werewolves in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's been an attempt at zombie romance, less successful. Yes. <laughs> No, I felt, though I dare say that there are people in the audience who would say that they've experienced some zombie romance. Uh, there are certainly people that I've met who say they've experienced, um, I think there's a very funny one out there called How to Date a Vampire, <laughs> uh, which is kind of take off on this whole thing, right. you know, rules for uh, dating such, how did I get onto this? <laughs> uh, well, I think the vampires and zombies are in the air, it's a catching they thing. They're definitely in the air, but right. the zombies I think more for the plants and zombies kind of they will eat your brain um, mm -hmm. interactive games yes that's true that's true well so you're you wouldn't buy then what what David Shields uh, in a forthcoming book of his how literature saved my life um, books if they want to survive need to figure out how to coexist with contemporary culture and catalyze the same energy for literary purposes that cut to the bone cut to the chase quality this is how to read and write now the undergraduates I teach are much more open to new reading experiences when it's a blog. The blog form, immediacy, relative lack of scrim between the writer and reader, promised delivery of unmediated reality. Well, of course, it's nonsense, as you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but maybe not but, everyone agrees with us. Okay, well, okay, right. well, let's go back to Hemingway and, and a All book right. called In Our Time, right. uh, which was very influenced by his experience writing for. Uh, newspapers mm -hmm. with uh, word lengths, mm -hmm. you know, and deadlines. Yeah. So In Our Time is, however, a work of literary fiction, mm -hmm. uh, but it uses the intercutting of shorter forms and that sense of present day immediacy. Right. But that present day immediacy that he was writing about was in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. This is not a new idea. No. Uh, the other thing about writing in the moment mm -hmm. is that it dates very very quickly, quickly right. if that's all you're doing. Right, right, right. There's quite a fun blog up there now mm -hmm. in which the guy's doing nothing but standing in lines and writing down what people are saying to one another. <laughs> <laughs> and can right. I remember the name of it? Of course not. Well, there's but it's one quite a overheard in New York that, that's been, it's a website that's been going for a while that's quite wonderful. This is the same sort of idea, right. and it might right. in fact even be the same website. So it, right. it's people uh, having a drink at a bar and people standing in line at the bank, and um, they do a lot of going ha ha ha. Right. I think there was one I, I would have never gone to college if it weren't for my horse. That seemed to have been overheard in a pancake shop restaurant. Yes, these, right. these things are fun for a while, but do they hold the attention for very long? Right. And would you say the same thing about uh, Twitter novels, about uh, novels that are published on the iPhone uh, that are very popular, popular, it seems, in Japan, but I don't think have, have caught they on? They lend themselves to Japanese. Right. right. So does the haiku. Right. So it's a Do, short, condensed uh, form. Right, and, a, and maybe a different relationship with... It's, it's a different... Well, the thing with that, and there's a man doing it on, on Twitter who has a website mm -hmm. called, uh, was it Very Short Fiction? Mm -hmm. Somebody mm -hmm. knows this out there. Somebody out, this, out there will know this. And uh, his are very clever. Mm -hmm. um, but it, is that all you're ever going to read? Right. No. Right. It isn't. Mm -hmm. uh, because going back to stories, stories are about something happening to someone. Mm -hmm. And if you have a, cl a plot of characters of more than two or three, mm -hmm. you're going to need a longer form. Mm -hmm. And if you have a length of time that you want to go into any detail about, you're also going to need a longer form. Right. So it's fun. It's a gimmick. It's like the French author who wrote a, a novel with not, without using the letter A. <laughs> you know, you think, well, that's so clever. Um, but there's only one of those. Right. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, uh, yeah. And, and the reason you read it is to see whether he ever slips up. You know, right. It's like that. Right. Yeah. And so you're not reading it necessarily for anything else in it. It's the right. gimmick. Yeah. Remember the maybe you don't because you're too young, but the musical Gypsy. Right. There's oh, a no. production number in it called "You Got to Have a Gimmick." Yeah. And in their case, the gimmick was tassel twirling and. Um, <laughs> a Nordic helmet that lit up and things like that as aids to stripping. 
but how many aids to writing of that kind do we need? Right. You know, how many, how many gimmicks do we need right. if we have more to offer than a gimmick? And you think people's drive to, to, to read and digest stories and the kind of stories they want to read. That's built in. Right. And it I, has I also have to say about media, having grown up with Marshall McLuhan, mm -hmm. um, every time a new piece of media hits, right. people are mesmerized by it. They think, whoa, radio was going to destroy the novel. Right. Television was going to destroy radio and the novel and, and, and movies too. And, and mentioned Bicycle Face. Would you do that? Oh, too? yes. Bicycle uh, when, Face. When trains came in in the 19th century, people thought that trains were going to cause everybody to have neurasthenic breakdowns because <laughs> they were going too fast. When bicycles came in, um, people got very afraid of Bicycle Face. <laughs> and Bicycle Face was caused by the speed of the bicycle, which would cause your <laughs> <laughs> This is we, a real thing. People we were, were just talking that we could maybe it. use that bicycle yes, face. Yes, yes. Right? People don't try it in traffic. Right. Uh, I mean, it would have the desired effect. <laughs> uh, but they really did think they were going to get bicycle face. And, and there are always these scares. Right. When TV came in, and I can remember this because I was a teenager and my parents refused to get a TV, which I was outraged. Uh, I said, I will be a social outcast. But I, I went and watched other people's TVs. But they used to sit in front of the TV in that, with that flickering blue light with TV tables. With TV dinners on them, <laughs> eating in a mesmerized way. Mm -hmm. they, they don't do that anymore mm -mm. that I have seen. Same. That I have seen. Some people do it at my house. Well, if you're watching something in particular, you right. do that. But sure. it used to be just the mere fact of it being on. Right, that it was so just, mesmerizing. Right, absolutely. I'm still a bit like that, but never mind. I've never quite got used to it. Mm -hmm. um, but then people, it, it becomes part of the background. Mm -hmm. you know, you're not riveted by it in the same way you were before. And, and the uh, interconnectivity and that kind of thing is, is going to be part of the fabric, mm -hmm. but it's no longer going to be an absolute riveting, mesmerizing, addictive thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's what I think. I may be wrong. Maybe we'll all end up in, in little pods <laughs> in which we're doing nothing but looking at the screen. Well, that hasn't happened yet. No, no. I do yet. think they're going to start doing summer camps uh, where you go and, and, and the rule is that no devices. No devices. Device free. It's like park your gun. Yeah. <laughs> you can't come into the bar unless you park your gun. The okay, camp okay. for the Luddites. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'm told by movie reviewers now that they make them park all their devices before they go in and, and screen the preview of the movie. Right. Oh, well. Because they're afraid they're going to record it and pirate it. That's right. Yeah. Well, well speaking of, of the living dead, uh, and people mesmerized as if dead in front of shiny boxes and things. Um, I love this, 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 uh, this, this quote of yours that I found when you did that interview with the Tools of Change Conference for Publishing, and you were talking about a, a writer is like a dead moose, which feeds at least three dozen other species. Um, thankfully for us, you don't have to be dead to give us a not, good meal. Not yet. No. <laughs> no, you look, you look well. You're looking, you're, looking, you're looking good. You're looking healthy. And you've said, think how many people Shakespeare has nourished. Um, I wonder if you could talk about that some more and talk about uh, who's nourished you. And I know it's different in different times of your life. Yeah. Maybe who's nourishing you now or who you revisit. OK, but so that particular presentation to O'Reilly's Tools of Change, mm -hmm. which can be found on O'Reilly's Tools of Change, publishing Pi Atwood. Um, <laughs> Was about, uh, was, about, was about the author, mm -hmm. because Tools of Change is pre presenting people with all of these publishing tools, you know, right. typeset yourself, uh, turn yourself into an interactive TV um, web streamed thing. Uh, and these tools are fine, mm -hmm. but if there's no author creating, there's nothing to be published. Right. So my question was really about the pie which once consisted of the author, 
and then on the other side, the printer, publisher, and bookseller who were <laughs> all the same person. Mm -hmm. And then, the, then it got bigger and these things split off. Right. More things got added. Right. Uh, wholesalers got added. Agents got added. Right. Then we have e-tailers. And then we have um, you know, instant delivery, Amazonian online ordering, right. all these different things. Right. Right. Um, editors and librarians and all these things. And my question was, the pie is this big, mm -hmm. and the customer will only pay this much. Right. You know, there is a ceiling to what people will pay for a book. Mm -hmm. And there's also a bottom ceiling or a floor, which is nothing. Mm -hmm. So somewhere between nothing and the ceiling, um, the writer is going to have to eat mm -hmm. somehow. Mm -hmm. Maybe they've got another job. Right. Maybe they have a rich relative. Maybe they married for money. Uh, maybe they won the lottery. Mm -hmm. uh, but suppose they're a freelancer and mm -hmm. they're living from their writing. How are they going to do that? Like you. So that's what I was talking right. to O'Reilly's Tools of Change mm -hmm. about. And I was saying, is the pie big enough to feed all of these segments um, of it? Right. And now we're seeing some of the segments coalesce, mm -hmm. seeing them come together. Mm -hmm. So e-tailers are becoming publishers. Yeah. Um, publishers are thinking of um, other ways to put things together and um, put them out. New platforms are being built. The author is being expected to do what the publicist and the publisher used to do all of. Mm -hmm. you now they used to do all of it. Now the author is being told, get yourself these tools, right. you know, do this promotion yourself. Right. So how is all that going to work? How is it going to come together? Will any of these pieces of the pie disappear? Right. And, I, and I asked you earlier, how necessary do you think that is? And, and how much has Twitter helped you to, to promote either your projects or someone else's? I usually end up promoting other people's. Uh, as I Very say, it's good like being a little radio station. Well, I'm old enough. Um, I can do that. It's like being a little radio station. But uh, how necessary is it? Mm -hmm. That depends. Mm -hmm. If you're Proust, it's not necessary. <laughs> Proust had money. Mm -hmm. Edith Wharton had money. Mm -hmm. She did do a certain amount of promotion anyway, mm -hmm. uh, which we forget that people in the 19th century promoted. Charles Dickens was a huge promoter. Right. He was also a, a very self-regulating businessman. Mm -hmm. He wanted all of the business threads in his own hands. He right. was very financially savvy. And he went out and killed himself doing public readings, right. uh, about which he said, if I do not have everybody in the audience in tears at the end, it's a failure. Oh. That's a high bar. Well, I hope we make somebody cry. I, it's, I don't think it's any longer the goal mm. uh, as it was then. Well, do you think, I mean, even if you're, you have means, you still want to sell books, you still want to have an audience, I would assume. I don't know if that's the only. Ego is a factor, I would imagine, as well. <laughs> <laughs> Not you, Margaret. Oh, of course not. <laughs> no, I wasn't talking about you. Looking at you sideways. <laughs> I know, uh. I caught that. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so going back, uh, we, we do get into these habits when young. Right. Uh, when young, I lived in a country that essentially didn't have a lot of publishers. Right, right. We started publishing companies, and w we were there for part publishers of ourselves. Right. And we went around giving, we, our generation invented the public reading. Mm -hmm. We started in coffee houses yeah. uh, with the washroom door that opened right onto the room where you were reading your plangent, heart-rendering poem just as somebody flushed, but never mind. <laughs> Get through that, you can actually do anything. Right. Uh, and we would sell our own books, which we would cart around in cardboard boxes in Greyhound buses, and we would make change with actual money. There weren't any credit cards then. Um, or pantyhose. Um, this was <laughs> early days. <laughs> early days. I'm just taking you back. <laughs> I'm taking Thank you back you. in time. <laughs> You're taking me to the, the men's yeah. underwear department as yes, well. Yes, that was later. 
And that we was would later. Put the money we'll in tell envelopes, you about that. And we would take right. the envelopes back and give it to the publishers, and they would put it in envelopes and put the actual cash in the bank. I know this sounds like the Stone Age, but that's what people did. So the idea that your writing life is over here somewhere right. in the court lined room right. with somebody bringing you these lovely little silver trays as you wrote away, that never happened to me. No. So to me, all of this is just another version of the envelope and the Greyhound bus. Mm -hmm. It's just a somewhat more convenient version of that. Right, and you still, you, you still write uh, in the same way, pen to paper or, or, or writing on your computer, write when you can. You, do you have a set time and none uh, of this? No. No. I wish I did. Yeah. I have a, th a theoretical set time mm -hmm. in theory. Okay. I have a set time. Mm -hmm. It's never actually worked that way. Yeah. It's inhibiting to me. <laughs> <laughs> now you have to write. Oh, no. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> the alarm goes off and off. Can't I do the laundry instead? Yeah. Whereas when you're doing the laundry, you know, that can be quite an impetus. Yes. I'd Better. rather be writing. Yes. Right. Like that. Right. I'm, okay. Well, you didn't answer, answer the question about who nourishes you, the writers that you return to, the the dead moose in your life? Or, okay, first or, of all, I think everybody has got a support group of alive people. Well, that's, that's important. And some of those are your readers, and some of them are your immediate uh, circle. And, and even your Twitter followers, would you count them among? They are my readers. Right. Um, even if they're only reading, even if they're only saying, never read any of your books, Margaret, but <laughs> I like your tweets. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're very honest. You gotta they're, give well, them that. Well, you are a somewhat more blunt uh, Despite the cat picture. Well, because of the cat picture. Right. You're ah, often more disguised because nobody actually knows who you are. Right. And people can be actually rather quite a lot ruder through social media than they would be face to face because they think mm. nobody can see them. Uh, and well, yeah. that nobody knows who they are because right. they're, they're, they're a cat, right? Right. They're a cat. Well, it, we said live people, no dead people nourish Oh, yes, a lot of dead people. A lot of dead people. Yes. All right. Shall we hear about some? Well, you could, but it would take a really, really long time. Why don't you pick five? Okay. Pick an age of my life. I, all right. Let's go with now. Now. Yeah. That's not fair. Why? Oh, you... I can't remember what happened yesterday. All right. All right. <laughs> the hell with that. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Something happens to your short-term memory, Amy. Like, what city is, it, is, is it the Twitter? Am I? Is it the you? tweeting? Uh, no. It's <laughs> <not>. <laughs> Come on, fess up. Uh, well, are there people you reread? Oh yeah. All right. Orwell. <laughs> <laughs> Let me grease the pole. <laughs> um, okay, are there people so you'd like to reread? Yes. Yeah, okay. Lots of books, too. <laughs> All right. Okay, my entire house is full of books. I have to tell you that. Paper books. They're everywhere. Yeah. Yes, on the floor, on the walls, in other rooms, um, in piles. How wonderful. It's not. Oh, because you... <laughs> sorry. Yeah, you have to figure out. <laughs> I'm this sorry. This goes on any much, much longer. I'm not going to be able to get out the door. No, I'm going I'm to be one of those elderly, wizened up people found in the... You know, the house full of the cat food, except we don't Well, have I was about anymore. to ask you, do you have cats? We have had, but we decided we were too old for that anymore. We, they die we, among the books. Well, we just didn't want to have that cat food problem. Okay. But we oh, do oh, have oh, the oh. book problem. <laughs> <laughs> There's two cat problems. One has to do with the empty tins. The other has to do with falling over it in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. So we didn't want to do either of those things, especially down the stairs. Oh, my. Bad idea. Yes. Yes, don't do that. No. No. Well, we can't because the cats are gone, but... Um, but well, the, you could. The books are still there. Right. And Good. what you especially don't want to do is move those piles around. Because remember what I said about <laughs> short-term memory. You'll forget that you've done that, <laughs> and you'll fall over them. Uh, so it's very hard trying to figure out which ones to give away. Uh, that is the problem uh, with books. Yes. You just don't want to give them so away. So you're just not going to give me a writer's name no matter oh, what. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Well, okay. Dead, right. ones, dead ones I will. If I give okay. you any live ones, yeah. all of the other live ones that I don't mention will hear about it, right. and they will be mad at me. Okay. We won't. And they will, they, they will say, why don't you like my book? 
Right. Let's stick with the and dead. And you'll say, I do like your book. Well, why didn't you mention it to Amy? Right. It'll be like we that. We don't want but that. But with Shakespeare, I don't have that problem. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I'll mention him. I'll always mention Chaucer, oh. uh, who is really the essence. But you can see yeah. the English essence just crystallizing right there in yes. that voice. Yes, yes. Um, and then we can go on down through the centuries and how I was ruined by uh, Jane Austen at the age of 12 because I got Pride and Prejudice as a graduation prize. And it does give you the wrong idea <laughs> that uh, okay. yeah. men, <laughs> men who are rude to you yeah. are are very nice underneath. Oh, and uh, yeah, that's dangerous at also, twelve. Also, yeah. also quite rich. Yes, you know that can be very yeah. de deceptive. Do you want to tell us about any of those? Um, I think possibly not today, Amy. Not today. La later we'll have to I come back and do uh, the writer's mind and the. Well, there is a novel thing that I said about time. Mm -hmm. So I'll just say about that that an, an event that can seem quite tragic when you're when you're 16 uh, can seem quite annoying when you're 30, mm. and rather hilarious <laughs> when you're 50. And then when you're 70, you actually can't remember who that was. <laughs> <laughs> ah, well, that, that, that's, this has that's not a, happened to you yet. Oh, yeah, well, it's, it's, it has it's in progress. it actually happened to me. It has. Yes. Oh. I can remember who they were. I just can't remember their names. I, I, none of these, these men have showed up on the Twitter following, have they? You don't know. Yeah, that's right. Back, back to that. They back. might be some feet. You just don't know. All right, well, well, I also want to talk quickly about debt with you. You don't do Twitter much, do you, Amy? No. No, also, no it's a choice. Is, you do not realize that this is like the Midsummer Night's Dream. I do follow you on Twitter. Middle scene. Ten minutes a day. Middle yeah. scene, when everybody's wandering around in the woods, uh, and some of them have been transformed into donkeys. Well, oh, God. Like. Well, you know, I have been dying to ask you about who you would turn into an animal ever since. Oh, many. Oh, now, yes. now we're talking. Yeah, now we're talking. But wait. <laughs> wait. Before we talk about lyo bams and rock we, hunks. Let's get into this. Shouldn't we be doing something more serious? Though? Yes. Well, I need to talk to you okay. about. Oh, oh, no. I can tell you about the neurology, though. Once you stop doing web things, your brain goes back to the way it was before. So despite the shallows, it's not lasting. Mm hmm. All right. You sure? Yes. All I'm right. Not, I'm actually not sure, but I think that's true. That's your theory. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, in, in Payback Debt and the Shadow, Shadow Side of Wealth, it's a, a wonderful book, wonderful documentary. Um, about debt in all its forms, and not simply money based financial debts, but about debts that can and can't be repaid. Um, uh, how do you repay the debt uh, if, if you've killed someone and, and how you've affected their family? Uh, in the film uh, The BP Oil Spill, how, how is that debt, that debt paid? I am curious about how debt has functioned um, in, your, in your work, especially in the Mad Adam trilogy, um, even in The Handmaid's Tale, this sense of of uh, a failure to um, to be responsible enough is another way of putting it, and the consequences of that. Because you're quite pro technology. It's really the human uses of technology that seem well, to be where we get screwed yeah, up. Yeah, technologies are just tools. Right. They're neutral in themselves. Right. Um, it's what, it's the choices that people make about them that are negative, or positive. Mm -hmm. uh, although some some tools, of course. Uh, because people do use them in the ways they do, can be quite destructive. Right. Uh, but others can be quite positive. And now I'm going to say something positive about the internet. Good. Okay. It is a, a great tool mm -hmm. for um, rallying certain kinds of, um, let us hope, productive social protest. Mm -hmm. uh, it has been very effective that way. There is a dark side to that, which is that. The, the net is, is leaky. Yeah. People right. can, can find you through it. Right. They can hack you. Right. Uh, they can steal your information. Right. Uh, so there's that dark side. And there is a very booming um, hacking business going on all over the world right now. Mm -hmm. But the positive side is that it connects people and puts information out there in ways that once would not have been possible. 
Yeah. As long as you have access to the technology. If you have access to the mm -hmm. technology and if you are not being subject to uh, one of the pretty stringent online censorship programs that are going on in various countries uh, right now around the world, right. those who are interested in that should check out something called Citizen Lab. Mm -hmm. Citizen Lab, that's what they work on. Uh, they work on how to keep the the web open and democratic mm -hmm. while um, preventing cybercrime mm -hmm. uh, and internet censorship. Okay. So that is how they would like to see. They would like to see it as an open forum, mm -hmm. as an open and free interchange place. Mm -hmm. That's my positive speech about the internet and Citizens Lab. And because Penn is a freedom of expression organization, it's appropriate that we mention that about oh, it. Oh, absolutely. And some of the people we support are bloggers who have been imprisoned in other countries right. for putting out information about repressive regimes on the net. Some of those people have ended up in jail. Some of them have ended up uh, with execution sentences on them. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So repressive regimes know that the internet can be used as a as a free expression place, and it can be very powerful that way. Right, and the transparency it provides for abuses. Of, uh, well, we rights. hope that it is. It can right. also be just an awful provider of misinformation. Right. If you want to read about that, the present edition of Wired magazine has got this hair-raising story about a young Korean pop star who was, through malicious lies, made the target of a very crushing um, online campaign. Sure, a lot he, of cyberbullying. Which he has oh, on a massive scale, on a massive scale. based on lies yeah. um, and fueled obviously by jealousy and envy. But he has come out of that, mm -hmm. uh, but it is a really cautionary tale. Yeah. So that's the dark side. Yeah. The dark side is the hacking, the piracy, the theft, the repression. The uh, bright side is the sharing, the democracy, the transparency the freedom of expression and the publication platforms that are offered. Right. It's like any tool. Yeah. It's neutral in itself. You can use a hammer to build a house. You can use it to murder somebody. Yeah. It's a hammer. Well, you are a dystopian who is mostly pro-technology. And you've been called. I'm, I'm neutral. You're I, neutral? I, I examine it. I, you, I explore and you make, it. And you make. Uh, I, I guinea pig myself. Yeah. Well, I was it. about to say you're very conversant in it, you're very fluid in it. So that would strike me as if you're willing to guinea pig yourself then you're then then that's that's a that's a vote of support. No, I think old people should do that. <laughs> no, they're essentially expendable. Um, so if I <laughs> if I come to grief with it, I will be a cautionary tale for for younger people. Mm -hmm. You know, I can try it out, see does this work for me. Um, I don't think anyone would think of you as a guinea pig, but that's interesting. I'm going to have to, I'm looking at you differently. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's making me do it. Um, mm -hmm. But it is interesting to explore. Unfortunately, there's no control. So for a really good scientific experiment, mm -hmm. I would have to have a mini me mm -hmm. um, who would look exactly the same as me and, and who wouldn't do these things. And then we could compare. Mm -hmm. OK. Well, I want to. I wanna, um, wind up a, a little bit uh, here because it's time for us to ask some, uh, allow the, the audience to ask some questions. Um, but I can't, I can't resist um, talking to you for just a minute about rack hunks and uh, wool vogs and oh, um, lyobams. Gene spliced animals. G right. They're with us today. And we're working quite hard on human beings. Hmm. Um, Is there anything you want with, to tell us? With Martin? the best of intentions. Right. <laughs> we always have the best of intentions, mm -hmm. uh, but we sometimes do extremely stupid things uh, with the best of intentions. Mm -hmm. So is there anything I want to tell you, nothing you don't already know, mm -hmm. which is that the ability to manipulate genes is the biggest Pandora's box on the planet. Mm -hmm. All right. And if you think you can keep that inside the box, uh, good luck. Right. Your, your teenagers are learning how to color code their nematodes um, probably right about now. 
Great. <laughs> the bright uh, side, you can probably get a whole kidney, heart, or, or liver grown just for you using new technologies. Already? Uh, they're working on it. Can I get it on Amazon? Uh, not yet. Mm -hmm. Not yet. Mm -hmm. Wait for it. You'll probably be able to order it that way sooner or later. And then, and then finally, there's one more thing I'd be remiss in not, uh, in not asking you about, which is that uh, you have a startup. Um, and uh, I don't know if, if everyone in the room knows, and uh, I, I wanted to ask you to tell me just a little bit about it, because we're, we're obviously running out of time, but also uh, what is it like to, to, to be a business person, to wear an entrepreneurial hat on top of everything else that, that you're doing? Right. Right. Um, so going back to the author. Okay. The author, and, the, and how is the author to... Um, eat their frugal lunch mm -hmm. of cheese sandwiches. Mm. <laughs> and going, Thank God I like a cheese sandwich. Yeah. yeah. Uh, going um, to the fact that publishers want uh, authors and creators in general to, to do more and more of the uh, Charles Dickens kind of thing, mm -hmm. putting themselves out there. Um, back before there were e-books or any any of the stuff, mm -hmm. I worked on how to make book signings um, remote with the use of video um, interchange and remote uh, real wet ink signing. Mm -hmm. And we actually did that, we built it, we, we did it all around the world, um, taking authors to places they would never otherwise go. Mm -hmm either mm -hmm. because they don't travel, because they were somewhere else at the time, because they couldn't travel. Mm -hmm. Norman Mailer made his last appearance in Edinburgh, Scotland, mm -hmm. except he was in his living room in Cape Cod. Mm. So he came up on a big screen in Edinburgh, and he said, I hate technology, <laughs> and I particularly hate this technology. <laughs> so thanks, Norman. <laughs> uh, we realized it was because he was somewhat deaf, so we turned up the volume, and then he looked out of the screen and he saw these 700 enthusiastic Scots, and he burst into full Normanhood mm -hmm. and uh, gave a wonderful rant, and uh, then he signed their books, mm. which were in Edinburgh, wow. except he was in Cape Cod. Fantastic, Hall. yeah. So doing that, mm -hmm. uh, which has now moved over into, believe it or not, um, remote signed mortgages. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <a>, you're taking <laughs> them by use storm. For that. Yep, um, <clears throat> means you don't have to get sit in your car for five hours and uh, drive to some mortgage expert, etc., etc., etc. Right, right. Uh, and we could talk about why certain forms of digisign are not hack-proof and why banks will only accept real writing on pieces of paper for right. certain kinds of things. Right. So that's over there. Um, it can still be used for the signing of creative artifacts, but meanwhile along came E. Mm -hmm. So how to do the E mm -hmm. with uh, an online um, interchange thing whereby I could interview you, you can mm -hmm. interview me, people from the audience could come in via their computers, ask a question, and then any f number of things could be signed for them, which would th they would then receive immediately in E form and put it up on their Let's name them all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, they're Tumblr, they're Twitter, they're Facebook, they're um, what else? Um, Stumble Upon, yeah. they're Pinterest. Pin Whoa. How many more are there? There's a lot. There are. There's more. Yeah. A great many more. So yeah, anything that you sign that way can be put on all those things, mm -hmm. should you desire it. Mm -hmm. Or say you wanted to give it to your friend. Mm -hmm. to Batsy. <laughs> well, we, tried to go, we, we tried to eliminate the part about the camera not working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was probably why. Yeah, so yeah. That's, that's what we're building. All right, Including wonderful. the buy it here uh, and all of those things that Is you Is there a do. website they can go to? Not quite yet. Mm -hmm. We did a beta at um, uh, Book Expo America last year that had some of the rud rudimentary things about it, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. but right now uh, we're adding a couple 
by actually writing quite a lot of other things. Okay. All right. Well, wonderful. So the great curtain reveal, unless it all collapses in a little pile of smoke. <laughs> <laughs> Supposing right. that doesn't happen. It's looking pretty good right now. Good. Right. Guinea pigging. So we'll it's not authors, musicians, films, posters, um, photographs, Signs. actors, right. audio books, um, all of those things. All Anything right. that can be oh, graphic artists, okay. of course. Okay, wonderful. Can all be done. All right. Well, why don't we? Why don't we? Now that you've been informed on her new projects, why don't we take some questions from the audience? Um, how about you? Um, you? Yeah. Um, do you want to come up to the to the microphone, darling, just so everybody can hear you? Do you mind? That would be great. Uh, I definitely respect your uh, unwillingness to talk about living writers and omit certain people. So I was originally going to ask you about your reading list, your current reading list. But I figured, since you're so tech savvy, maybe you have a Netflix queue instead. If so, what's on it? Do you have a Netflix queue? Um, I haven't had um, very good luck with Netflix. I think because I live in a house that is old, and my reception is bad. It's either that or I need a new computer. Um, I have guinea pigged myself on various reading devices, but I haven't yet gone to the tablet. So I think what I probably need for Netflix is a tablet. Am I right? I don't know. You don't know. <laughs> I'm a terrible young person. Yes, but I do like watching movies. And I do like watching old movies. And um, I will watch an, any an old movie, practically, that is put in front of me. And some new movies. I saw Avatar with the... With the you uh, wore the glasses? And absolutely. Everything? Wow. I wish I were there. I remember that. 3D, the first time it came around, they did Kiss Me Kate with Howard P. Keel throwing a banana peel oh, at you. Yeah. Yes, that was... And then it sort of faded away. I also went and saw Back the Alice in, in Wonderland huh? movie with the 3D glasses. Mm. And I, I guess there's, they're probably going to try to make you get the 3D glasses for your TV, aren't they? Uh, I think then they'll try to get you the 3D glasses for your tablet. <laughs> and then you'll have to have the 3D glasses for your Kobo and your Kindle and your Nook. No, I don't, I don't know about all that. It's maybe t carrying it a bit too far. But what if you wear real glasses? Then you have to put the 3D glasses on top of them. I think we have a question over here. Yeah, okay, so I'm talking, I'm talking as somebody with three Twitter accounts. I've been a social media director, so I'm really embedded. You've got three Twitter accounts? Wow. Yeah. So and what I, are your other names? What women meow, make? Meow, meow, are you, are you that person? My, my, my company is one, my actual name is one, and then I have a, a blog about women called What Women Make. So okay, so none one. of them are animals. No, they're, none of them are cutesy. No, oh well. Uh, <laughs> or, or ferocious, right? Or ferocious. But so, so that's where I'm coming from. But okay. I also so you've done this for a while. Yeah, so I know. I, yes, you know I'm the comfortable on, online, but you know the pitfalls. Another part of my life, I wrote. I took four years, and I wrote, you know, 333-page novel, and I'm really reluctant to put that online and put that out there as an unpublished author. But I'm still waiting to get an agent and all that stuff. And so from this, like, I'm there really are agents in the room. Yeah, <laughs> but I don't think I'm really representing myself right to get <laughs> stumbling over my question. But do you think that you like a piece loses its integrity if it's a novel, a fully baked novel, to put it out there online or seed it? It feels like you would diffuse the integrity of a piece by putting it out there on these platforms, other than you know. So are you the, talking about serial publishing or are you talking about e-publishing? I'm talking about. I'm talking about being a writer and this idea that you can put your stuff out there like a, a full novel without an agent or without the Yeah, people people, people are doing that. People are doing that. And she's um, wondering if it's wise. Is it wise? Yeah, like we don't, don't you I, think a piece might lose its integrity? It's, it's well, it's it, more likely it's going to get lost in the shuffle and end up at the bottom of the pile because nobody will know it's there. So you have some experience in pushing stuff out through so social media, so you could probably use your experience to do that, but would you reach the reader that you're trying to reach? How would you go about doing that? 
So I, I can't give you any advice because I haven't read your book. So I don't know what kind of book it is. Well, I'm saying know. like in digital media, I'm completely unafraid to talk about all kinds of things in little bite-sized pieces or even blog posts, but writing a novel with characters and layers. You want you the person to be pieces. able to have the whole thing in their hands so that they can have a deep dive into it and read it in depth. Exactly. Do you lose that if you publish? In you can, you can do it on, on uh, print on demand, you know. You can do it on Lulu or one of those other things and, and have paper books. That too can happen. I, there's, would, there's I, I, I would advocate working with an editor. I would, I would also. <laughs> we can talk after yes. this. <laughs> I, would, I would advocate working with an editorial function of some kind. Um, yeah, I just feel like those the traditional powers that be, and that that's important. I just I have a hard time letting go of that. Of wanting the traditional to be powers that be. Well, the traditional powers that be are always in flux anyway. Why is that? People die. Um, you know, unless things replace themselves, it's like a coral reef. Uh, unless they replace themselves, the whole thing just disappears. And I think having an editor. I think that's actually the you know, a really important point that if you don't have an editor, you don't have that kind of relationship, then you can you know, publish something before it's ready. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, publishing writer. something before it's ready can be a serious mistake. Mm -hmm. Now, the next question you will ask is, how do you know it's ready? And that there isn't an answer to that. Mine's, mine's completely ready. It's it needs ready. an editor. Okay. But it's um, ready, okay. ready. Here she is. She has a completely ready novel. <laughs> Um, did you? Hi. Yes, and then you, darling, after it. Okay. Hi. Um, thank you so much for coming. It's been such a pleasure listening to you. Um, you mentioned earlier that everybody writes for someone, even if it's their future self. And I just wondered who you write for and how that has changed over time. I write for the ideal reader. Who's the ideal reader? Well, the ideal reader. I used to think the ideal reader was this old man who lived in the clouds. <laughs> and that he knew everything right. and uh, would give me an A, you know, <laughs> like that. I like and then I realized that that person didn't exist. Uh, but the ideal reader does exist out there somewhere. It's just that you don't necessarily know who that person is. So I'd say the ideal reader is the, the person who's um, interested in what you're writing about, gets the jokes. Um, empathizes with your characters, doesn't confuse them with you, um, indulges in the play of the, of, of the story, which it always is a play. You, you're, there's always something you don't know at the beginning, so you, the reader, are always on a quest going through the book looking for what's going to happen next. Um, so that's who the ideal reader is for me, and I, I know they're out there, um, and sometimes they they, they sure, some of the people on Twitter sure sound like the ideal reader, couldn't put it down, that's the ideal reader. Uh, <laughs> laughed at the funny parts, uh, that's the ideal reader. For me, the ideal reader is not the one who says, well, this was a very serious book. Um, <laughs> or the one who says, well, this was a very frivolous book. Uh, <laughs> somewhere in between. Uh, so that, that, is, that is who that person is. It's the ideal reader for you for you may not be the same as the ideal reader for me. And that is the really remarkable thing about books and readers. It's very much not one size fits all. It very much is each reader is an individual human being and so is each writer. So it's always a one-on-one -on -one, and all this talk about you know the massive readers and the readers and the audience and all of that you're still just dealing with one reader at a time. And that's the person who's going along with you and being with you on their interpretive reading, which is what it is, uh, just as when a violin player plays a score, that is that player's interpretation of that piece of music. So the reader is your interpreter. And therefore, you want the ideal reader to play your piece as beautifully as it can be played. That's their reading of it. This uh, just came to me by email today called Death by Kindle. And I wasn't aware that Amazon has just dropped the distribution of uh, alternative literary presses, small presses, 
from their distribution. They've decided to discontinue a lot of e-books that small literary presses were doing. All of a sudden, they've been cut off from their income. And this writer, I'm just saying what he's saying because he's a, he does the uh, Santa Fe Writers Project. And this just came to me. I don't even know if I know him or who he is. But he's writing this article, Death by Kindle. And there are many such. Since March, Amazon has decided to just drop a lot of small presses from the ebook industry. And he's very concerned that, once again, the bigger presses will be controlling all of our literary tastes. You know and what the Chinese say? Yeah. The, char the character that says crisis is also the one that says opportunity. Uh -huh. And that, to me, is a great big opportunity that just presented itself to small presses to get together and make their own e-retail store. What are they waiting for? Mm -hmm. They already have the e-books. Um, they just need to put a website there where people can go if they're looking for new small press, new writers, and all everything that's new. They should form a cooperative. I'll give them that advice. <laughs> well, not even just a cooperative. You know, somebody could just start the e-store, and it'll be the e-store for those presses. Yes, there's really hundreds of them that have been dropped. Yeah, well, well, there they are, and, and collectively they they have a lot of books, yeah. and people who are scouting, you know, people who are looking for the unknown and the undiscovered yet, uh, the next thing. That's where they're going to go, including agents, including publishers. Um, they that would be a real service for somebody to start that. Mm -hmm. Of course, they've just suddenly been deserted after becoming dependent on Amazon. And there's hundreds of small presses that this is happening to after they began to make their living from ebook. So it's going to be a transition phase if they can do that quick enough to survive. They, they should do it uh, quite quickly. Yeah. What are they waiting for? <laughs> but you know, they're not the only um, ebook store. What about the Nook? What about the Kindle? What about Sony? Uh, what about the Sony Reader? What about iTunes? What about the so, iBooks? Of course, he's making the point that Kindle is the, still the biggest bestseller for their eBooks, for the well, small presses. Well, then that will rearrange itself. Yeah, it you will. Know, Hopefully this, fast enough for them to survive. Well, that'll be their challenge. I mean, none of this stuff actually scares me, because when we started, we started from zero. You know, so you, you start something, you build it up. Okay, um, thank you. One more question. The last question, I, then I think we have to. Uh, yep. Um, is this okay? Um, I've recently started reading a lot of um, crowdfunded fiction on the internet on places like Dreamwidth and various websites. I was wondering what you think of crowdfunded fiction, which tends to be more serialized and tends to be funded largely through tip jars or subscriptions or things like that. Crowdfunded fiction. Um, it's it's back to the old storyteller tradition in which the storyteller would sit in the town square um, with their cup <laughs> and they would tell stories. And if people didn't like their stories, they wouldn't give them any more coins in their cup. And if they did like their story, they would, uh, they would egg them on. Or to take a somewhat more dire version of that, Scheherazade, uh, who had to interest the audience or she was going to get her head cut off. Right. Uh, so <laughs> So it's like that, and uh, it's the same principle. Things used to be serialized a lot in magazines and in newspapers. Uh, Dickens used to serialize himself in the early days. That's how he uh, wrote. He wrote in numbers, and if people lost interest in the, in the novel, it was discontinued. Right. And same with serializations of, of all sorts of different kinds. So they are structured in a certain way by which I mean that if you don't end your installment on a cliffhanger or a question, people are not going to be so motivated to read on and find out what happens next. So it does have a certain form. Um, what about but I think it's innovative. It's an innovative approach, and it's the return of the, of the pulp serial, if you like, uh, in a different form. Thank you. Oh, OK, guys, we're going to close and that we're selling books outside and Margaret's actually radio sh serials same yeah. thing yeah. Um, <laughs> Margaret's going to sign some books as well so we'll we'll see you outside hopefully thank you